what I want to do tonight is talk about doing vir virtual inspections. A lot of you have joined Metro because you want to be able to work from home. You want to be able to control your schedule and you still want to er earn a lot of money. You can do that with the virtual inspecting, but you have to learn how to do it. And then you have to have, you have to really get yourself into a process with it. So, you know, when we were doing face-to-face uh, -face appointments, you had to make sure that you had your toolkit and you had to make sure you had uh, your iPad and you had to make sure that you had your, uh, you know, you <coughs> dressed all up and stuff. That is not the case necessarily when we do virtual appointment, but there still is planning involved. You still have to make sure that you've got the Zoom set up properly. If you are going to use a free version of Zoom, you have to recognize the fact that there's a time limit that's probably going to be associated with it. And if there, if it does, uh, if you do run out of time, you have to know how you're going to have your client re-engage with you so that you can finish it up. You have to have a PDF of the policy in front of you so that you can share that and you can talk through the policy with the client. You have to learn how to pin a video or a camera so that you can take a look and you can view damage in, a, in somebody's home. You have to have a checklist so that you know what you're going to be looking for. And then I recommend that you put some kind of background together. But whatever it is, if you've got a background like Rena uh, does, you know, just a, a nice, um, a clean background, that works out okay. Um, but you want to try to make it so that your background is not, uh, it's not um, taking away from what you're trying to do. During the meeting, you're going to do a flip chart. You're going to do that via Zoom. And then you're going to redo a, re review the policy. And then you're going to conduct uh, the inspection. And really what we're talking about tonight is that inspection. Here is an inspection checklist. I have this uh, in, uh, in PDF form. So if you do not have a copy of this, send me a, an email. Uh, all of us have this copy. Uh, this is really helpful. Uh, it does help you kind of think about things to look for in a home so that you can kind of uh, go through and, and identify whether or not any of these things are true in the home that you're looking at. Any questions about this? No? Okay. What else should you have? Well, you should see if your client has a flashlight. The better the flashlight, the better you're going to do as far as your inspection goes. If you have a trainee that's going to be doing the inspection on site with the client, make sure that the trainee picks up a, a, a good flashlight. If you have not purchased a good flashlight, I recommend you go to AutoZone or Home Depot or Lowe's. Um, there's a bunch of places that sell flashlights that are over a thousand lumens. That's the key. So you want to have it over a thousand lumens. It should cost you maybe $29. Sometimes you can get them as low as $18. Uh, I would never spend more than $35 on a flashlight. I don't know what you would spend. it. I don't, I don't know how, why they would charge that much for a flashlight, but you know, some people do. You want to have a game plan as to how you're going to approach the house. You might want to start with the front of the house or start with the outside of the house. If it's, especially if you're during the day and, and uh, you're doing this, this in the early evening and the sunlight may go away. Uh, do that right up front. Review um, what kind of building materials are there. Is it, is it brick and siding or is it just brick? Is it just siding? Is the siding aluminum siding or is it vinyl siding? Um, do you see lifted shingles on the roof? Are there any missing shingles? Look at the soffit and the gutters. I was just doing a fire claim for Renee down in um, Maryland and uh, the soffit, uh, the house next door uh, caught fire and the soffit and the gutters were damaged um, considerably on the house next door, which was the house we were working on. So there was melted siding. There was gutters uh, replace 
and there was uh, lifted shingles. So these are all things that you can take care of uh, and you can view and take pictures of. Now, how are you going to take pictures of this? Well, we're going to do an example of this. Robert and I are going to kind of go through his house and um, uh, he's going to show how uh, you, I would have a client use their camera to, uh, to help me identify damage in the house. When you go inside the house, you want to start maybe in the kitchen. Uh, why? Because there's a lot of stuff that goes wrong in kitchens. Why? Because there's fire, there's smoke, there's water. <laughs> there's just about everything that can go wrong on the house can go wrong in a kitchen. So you want to look and identify where is their hardwood? Where is their ceramic tile? Where is their vinyl flooring? Those are your key things for your flooring. Understand flooring is where the money is in a home. That's where the largest expense is in rebuilding and in renovating and in repairing a home. The most money is really in the floors. Uh, the next uh, is, is probably your walls if you've got wallpaper. But really painting walls and, and your ceiling and stuff, uh, that doesn't cost a lot of money oftentimes. So it's the flooring where you're going to get money. Do they have a fireplace? If they have a fireplace, you may want to uh, make sure that you've got a smoke sponge. Window air conditioners. You want to make sure that you take a look underneath those air conditioners uh, because the, oftentimes water will seep out of the air conditioner and will damage uh, the windowsill or maybe the wall uh, underneath the, the uh, air conditioning unit. Look below the bathrooms. Look for damage on the ceilings and on the walls. Is there any water pockets? If they have live plants, put your hand very carefully on the floor underneath those plants. See if there's been any overwatering of those plants. And notice I say kids, but not pets. Why? Because this is funny. Kids are involuntary. Did you know that? That's the, the kids are part of the family. But pets, you voluntarily put pets in your home. And so they are not an accident. So anything a pet does in your home is not covered by your insurance because it's not an accident. My pet is my kid. <laughs> Yeah, for a lot of people, that's true, but not by insurance. You don't, the obvious damage is always, I mean, you're, you're, it's always nice when you have that, but it's rare that you're going to have the obvious damage. It's much more likely that you're going to find something that's a lot more subtle. Like, for example, how would you describe the damage uh, or how would you describe someone to take a look at that door jam? for that uh, sliding glass door. There's damage there. Do you see it? It's that discoloring right up above the, uh, the carpet. That's water damage. Because of that damage, there might be damage underneath that carpet and that carpet itself might be damaged. You might want to lift that carpet and see if, if there's a, uh, a uh, delamination of the uh, the backing of that carpet with the, uh, with the the top of the carpet. How would you describe the left hand picture there with the siding? Is that a claim? Yes. Yeah, that's called paint overspray, and that is a claim. Uh, that that siding you can't repair it. If you try painting that siding, oftentimes if the sun beats down on it, it'll actually warp and melt the siding. The addition of paint to a siding that is not supposed, to, that is pre-painted, oftentimes creates so much heat that it will actually melt the siding. So if you have somebody that's actually painted their siding, uh, you, have the, you should be really looking at that for, melted, uh, for effects of melted siding. The picture on the right is a cabinet, and you can see there that water damage has gone from the corner all the way down, and you can see the line of where the water has evaporated. That is permanent damage to that cabinet, and that is a replaceable item. 
obviously you know how to talk about the ceiling here, but now that the ceiling is so close to the wall, do you think that there's wall damage? Uh, you can't really see too much, but it's right here. There's actually, there's a, a water bubble right here. The siding's been pulled off of this through wind damage. What will need to be repaired? How much of the siding will have to be replaced? Do you know? All of it, right? All of it. All of it, the entire side. How about this damage here on the uh, on this uh, on this ceiling? This is water damage. Is that a claim? It very well might be. Uh, you've got uh, looks like uh, electrical paint uh, or some kind of tape residue here on the carpet. That's actually a claim. That's called an all risk claim. You have a, a puncture here. Uh, you know, Robert was a little bit too aggressive in uh, throwing the baseball and uh, damaged the siding. That that's, was my son, not me. Uh, yeah, that's what they always say. Um, but that's an insurable loss. Actually, you can see that it was probably a tree branch because you can see that the siding has been damaged below that as well. So that, that's a significant loss. That'll require the entire side to be replaced. Can you see the damage here on the roof? OK, yes, you have it up here, but now you've got it here. You've got damage here and you may have damage here. So this is this becomes an extensive loss uh, because you've got at least three roofing surfaces that are going to need replacing. You may get the entire roof replaced because of that damage. Here's a, uh, a broken tile. Um, is that broken tile an insurable loss? Very well, Mike. Yes. Well, mm -hmm. you can't say yes just off. Off. Uh, you, you have to find out why. And One if the there's other that, tile cracks on your floor too. Well, yeah, you, I don't see any on this one. But if if that floor was laid improperly, then this could be a a um um. Oh, I'm going to forget the name of it. Construction error, contractor error. No, it's a a, de a depression. Uh, crack or something like that but what it means is, is that the cement bed was not laid cleanly and smoothly and so uh this this uh tile was cracked because of that uh that um cement bed that is not an insurable loss if you dropped something and it cracked it now we have an insurable loss that's called impact damage and that would be covered you can see water damage here on the uh, on the wall, all going all the way down to the floor. The the damage here, the discoloration of the carpet, uh, right here near the floor or near the wall versus out further. Uh, you can see that it's been what you know it's been water um, uh, saturated. You know, again, wind damage on a roof. You have the roof, but now we also have to look at the substructure of the roof. This is damaged more than just the roof. This has damaged the rafters. It's damaged uh, insulation. It may have damaged uh, the interior to the home as well. Melted siding comes in a lot of different varieties. Uh, this is really, you know, clearly, uh, this is a lot less so. Um, I have a home that I, I, I had in Cincinnati that had melted siding, and we can't figure out where the melted siding came from. I, I, could, I had to walk away from the claim because unless I can point to a particular event or something that happened, I thought that there had been a, um, uh, a, a uh, that the, the fireplace had, um, had been mis, mis, misused and that it had overheated and that the siding had melted from that. Uh, we had an engineer come in and the fireplace was okay. In fact, when we opened up the wall, the, the, uh, the siding, there was no sign of even smoke or, or heat at all to the interior of the chimney. So what caused the siding to melt? I, I have no idea. But I had to walk away from the claim because without apparel, I couldn't do anything. I looked around. I, I wanted to see if there was any windows that might have reflected the sun and caused the heat damage. 
Did you know that the windows are now so resistant to heat that they reflect that heat off and they will actually melt the siding of the next door home? <laughs> if you have melted siding and, and you can't figure out where it came from, look to see what kind of windows are next door because it could be something like that or it might be solar panels that are also reflecting the heat off. Well, Paul, I have a question. Yeah. So how, how about it just being the sun? Could the sun just do that directly? Then why didn't it do it throughout the whole house? It only did it on the chimney. So I asked her if she had had a, a, a you know, a, a, um, a grill. Maybe she'd put a grill next to it. Nope. I mean, I gave her every chance. <laughs> Paint over spray we talked about. You know, uh, I did a claim up in Maine uh, where a lawnmower creased the siding of the house and I got the siding replaced. Um, here you've got some uh, um, fiber concrete um, siding and it got, uh, it got damaged through a stone that got thrown up. Uh, that's an insurable loss. Now, you want to try, hopefully it's the homeowner that caused the damage. Because if it's not, then the insurance company is going to try to go after the lawn care facility or the lawn care providers uh, to get them to pay for the damage. I have when a you question. Have, yes. Um, I know somebody, and, and I don't know, so that's why I'm asking. I know somebody that accidentally ran into the outside spigot on the side of their house with the lawnmower. It damaged pipe and the spigot with that so then you have to figure out what's the deductible if it's a thousand dollar deductible the uh the replacement of that gutter might be 50 bucks maybe it's 200 dollars. but if you have a one thousand dollar deductible you got to have some more damage in order to make it worthwhile to write a claim right so we try to have claims equal to at least two to three times whatever the deductible is. So if somebody's got a $1,000 deductible, I'm trying to find a $2,000 or $3,000 claim minimum in order to write the claim. At that point, we're then helping the client. If it's anything smaller than that, we may not be helping the client. Now, we still may write it if they want us to and if it's going to help the, uh, the trainee and the trainee is on board with it you know, then, then maybe that's going to work, but on a normal mm -hmm. ongoing business basis, you want it to be at least two to three times the deductible. You might have hardwood floor damage near the, near where water could come in from a front door or from a window. So these are, these can be strong uh, claims, very, uh, very good claims. Here's a claim I did um, where you had, uh, this was uh, mm -hmm. down in Georgia. And uh, the client left the windows open and a thunderstorm hit while she was not at home. And so the rain came into her dining room. And you can see here how there's lifting of the hardwood floors at the edges. That's called decompression. And that's all you need to replace the entire hardwood floor. I got her about $10,000 for that replacement. Not bad. Fireplace damage, another place, another thing that you always want to look for. If they've got a fireplace, you want to check for smoke. You don't check for smoke necessarily up above, although with a propane fire like this one, you might. Uh, but in these cases, you're going to really find it more uh, at the windows where the, the, the cold air is going to be. A fireplace also may pop out embers. And if they do, that's a fire, that's a fire claim. It's not a, a you got to have a large carpet for that, but that's a, that's a, that's a, a claim. Um, overflows on the, on the um, sinks. You got to look, once you find the damage in the sink area, then you look at the doors to see whether or not there's any decompression on the doors. I called it warped doors, but you know, that's, that's, that's really what we're talking about is decompression of that wood. Look for staining that might have occurred. 
uh, that might cause some personal property to be uh, to be damaged and to require repair. Remember, an accidental discharge of water is, in fact, a named peril. So any personal property that gets damaged is covered on a named peril. Here's a claim I did up in Maine. You see this one little piece of decompressed wood at the corner of the dishwasher? This floor extended out over a thousand square feet. And I got the whole thing sanded and stained. Again, about $10,000 because of that one corner. So this is the kind of thing we look for when we're doing a virtual inspection. And, and Robert will, will, uh, will show us how that works. Here's an, a claim I did in Virginia. This one is where a, a 12 year old son uh, took ice cubes out of the door of the refrigerator, let them fall on the floor and didn't pick them up. <laughs> Great 12 year old. What a classic move. So what ended up happening was they melted and you can see the decompressed wood here on the hardwood floor. Jackson has his hands raised for some reason. Uh, Jackson, go for it. Yeah, I was just wondering here in Utah, there's a lot of swamp coolers. And one of the things that I've seen is that for people who run their swamp coolers uh, too much or something, I don't know what it may be, it delaminates their doors like what you were saying. And it makes it so all their interior doors uh, no longer fit. Is that so? If, if we could, so, Jackson, if that was a uh, situation where we could identify a particular day where it was extremely bad and where maybe there was some condensation that occurred or whatever, then we could write a claim. Otherwise, it becomes wear and tear because it's happening over time. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So, yeah, no, that's that's a that's a good that's that's a, a good question. And that's that's the kind of claim that a client is not going to know about until we help them identify it and identify that the insurance company actually owes them money for this. I got this client about seven thousand dollars for resanding and staining this hardwood floor that went throughout their first floor. Mm. Now, they're not going to fix it right away. Why did they why did they write a claim if they're not going to fix it right away? Well, their thoughts are is that my 12-year-old son is going to be a 13-year-old son. <laughs> and so the potential for additional damage on this floor is significant. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that $7,000, we're going to put it in um in the mar uh in, in the bank and then when he turns 18, we'll refinish our floor. The reason for that is is that once the floor gets damaged again. Now the insurance company may not be liable for any of it. You see, now it becomes wear and tear because there's multiple instances of damage. You have to grab a claim when you can. And that is may, may not be the most perfect time for the client, but if they don't do it at that point, they lose the opportunity to get compensated by the insurance company for that damage. And that's the whole reason they have that insurance policy is so that they can get compensated. Uh, if they lose it, that's really unfortunate. Paul? Yes. Tell me, like in a situation like that where they don't replace the floor immediately, if there is depreciation that's withheld by the insurance company, how do they go about getting that? They won't get it. You have to walk away okay. from that. In that case, they're going to walk away from it. Uh, now, the floor was relatively new, so there really wasn't a lot of depreciation on it, so they didn't really worry about it. But you're right. Uh, if there's a big difference between the actual value and the uh, replacement value that the insurance company provides, that could be an issue. Paul, question. <laughs> yes. Bless you. Um, so what determines when there's a full replacement versus just sanding and staining? It's whether or not you can uh, sand and stain it without it getting down into the uh, groove. Uh, hardwood floors have a groove 
and uh, you have to be able to stay above that groove. So it's usually can be sanded and stained twice. Um, typically after the second sanding and staining, it's a replacement. Okay. Uh, this is a friend of mine. He's a uh, six degree black belt. Uh, don't mess with him. Uh, but at any rate, he, um, he had some trouble in his bathroom and uh, had water, uh, accidental discharge of water in the bathroom. He started making some repairs on it, but he thought that that was going to be a good claim. I took a look at the house and realized that the insurance company was not going to pay on it because he made too many. He, he'd already cleaned it up too much. Mm -hmm. So I went through the rest of the house. Well, his son has this, uh, this, um, this fish tank. And look at the decomp uh, decompression of the wood. The, the fish tank, uh, he had, he had a, a break in it, or he had a leak. So I actually got him paid for the hardwood floors on the second floor because of this fish tank. He ended up um, getting paid for the entire second floor because the whole hardwood, the whole floor was continuous in the upstairs. And then all he did was fix the ba uh, th that bath, uh, that bedroom. So he was able to take the rest of that money and apply it towards the bathroom. So this is an instance where I, we were able to find a claim that actually he didn't realize was a claim and get him paid enough that he was actually able to help on the damage that he had originally thought was a claim. Does that make sense? Okay. Burned cabinets from ovens. Also, you have to look underneath the cabinets to see, uh, you know, this has some grease splatter. There is no fire damage. You don't, there is no uh, damage there, but you can see that there's been grease. So there, there may have been a grease fire. Spattered grease on the wall wallpaper could be indicative of a claim as well. You have to look at the bathrooms uh, under the sink, uh, near the toilet. L look for discoloration. All right. So, Robert. Now you can hear me. Yeah, plus yeah, a little feedback. How's that now? Is that better? Yep. So now I'm going to uh, switch my camera. Okay, so now you can see. So... <laughs> Everybody, um, if I, I don't know uh, if that's so what I'm doing is I pinned it to mine. I don't know whether you pinned it to yours, but everybody, if you can pin Roberts, you click on the upper right hand corner of his picture and it'll say pin it. And then that way you can it'll enlarge that picture so that everybody can see it. Are we good? Everybody got that? Somebody talk to me. Just say yes. No? Got it. All right, good. It. All right, so we have a laminate floor here. Okay. I've so, had Robert, let me let me let me let me uh, have let me walk you through like you were my client, okay? Okay, good. So um Robert, what I'd like you to do is walk into the room. And um you told me that you thought that there was a place where you you had some uh decompression that, that it was kind of sticking up. Where is that? Right there. You can see how it's, you can see. Uh, so doing this right. what I'd like you to do is put the, uh, the, the flashlight perpendicular to the, to the, uh, to the floor. It's on the floor. I know, but now I want it perpendicular to the, to the, to the way the floor is. Yeah. No, put it back down on the floor again and then put it crossways on the, on the floor. That's what I'm looking for. All right. So with it, with the flashlight in that position, now be a little bit slower on the on the movement. Um, guys, stop stop right where you are, uh, Robert. So in the uh, at at about ten o'clock in the photo, you can see shadows. What happened here? So you're okay. We got it. We got it back. Move your thumb. So you can see right at the top about. Well, let me see. One, two, three, four um uh lengths of wood out you can see a shadow on the wood and you can actually see it up front too on the second one in between the second and third you can see that there's a shadow there you want to have the client 
use the perpendicular positioning of the of the flashlight so that they can it maximizes any kind of lifting of the laminate floor or the hardwood floor. All right, so does everybody see that damage there? Now, if you're smart, what you're doing is you you record it, okay? Record it. Somebody turn off your, Robert, I think that was you, maybe. You're going to record this so that you can then uh, walk back on on the video and take still shots of this that you can then use in the claim. All right, now. Um, Robert, now take the, the, uh, the flashlight and put it towards where that black, uh, it, it looks like it might be a door with a blue and a white strip, a stripe or something. Yeah, it's and, a door. Okay. So put it the opposite direction, uh, near the door so that we can see the floor from that perspective. You see how the edges see pop the out? Edges pop out? That's that's the uh, that's the damage that we see. Uh, look at the shadow that you see on that one piece of dust, or those two pieces of dust. You know that's that's what we look for. Um, that's that damage is enough to replace that laminate floor. Now Robert told us that that floor got damaged too long ago, and so he has he he's not able to write that up as a claim. What I always do is I always tell people that you know we can write up anything that has happened in the past year and um i just need to know a date that it happened and we'll write it up um we are at 754 is there any other thing that you, we can uh, look at in your oh uh Oops. robert get get your flashlight back again all right what now happened? what i'd like you to do okay we got it again do you have a wall that's a plaster wall or a, uh, a drywall? Yeah. Uh, get, your, get your thumb out of the picture. Can we turn the light on? Um, yeah, I'm not so so bad. One of those just there. So put the flashlight up against the You see how you can see the grain? And look at how good this is. This is just a camera uh, photo, guys. But look at how good that is. If there was a water pocket on that wall, you can see a depression, or I mean, um, uh, the wall comes out a little bit there about halfway through the picture. It's not enough to be damaged, and we'd have to identify what caused it if, if it was right there. You can see the shadow on that wall there. So that could be water damage that had occurred. Um, again, we'd have to have the client tell us whether or not it is. You can't see it, Philip. Uh, right about uh, um, Robert, make that that uh, that shadow about dead center shadow in the picture. The- yeah, there you go. Perfect. So, does everybody see that now? Yeah, no. I don't have any video, uh, Robert. What's that? Oh. What's that? I can't see it. They come in and go out on me. Oh, okay, so we got a little bit oh, of okay, bandwidth so issue, maybe there. there. Yeah. All right. So, okay, now- sorry, Paul. All right. That room is cement. That room is cement. And uh, I don't have good uh, network connection in that room. Okay. Or, or, or. I'm going to hang up now and go back to the other connection. All right. So, guys, that's that's what we do as far as um, that's how we go through the house. Now, if that was an actual uh, client, what I would be doing is I would go through and have them go outside. Uh, I, I can see um, damage to the outside of the house. I can see um, missing shingles. Um, I can see cracks in siding, uh, when I'm indoors, you saw how you can see the flooring and the damage there. You can see, um, discoloration on a ceiling. So what you want to do is get a routine down that works for you. I highly recommend you start off in kitchens that you start off looking at the floor. You identify what kind of flooring material it is. If it's, Um, anything other than ceramic tile, you're going to want to put that flashlight down just as I indicated perpendicular to the grain of the, of the floor. So that you can see whether or not there's any decompression and you do that in front of the refrigerator, you do it in front of the dishwasher, you do it in front of the sink. Okay. Those are your first three things that you do. 
then you look for anything else. You look for scratches on that floor. Floors are really where it's at. Okay. The only time flooring becomes a little bit less expensive and not sometimes a claim is wall to wall carpeting. Wall to wall carpeting is the least expensive kind of flooring material. And so you, you kind of have to be careful on that. What about linoleum damage from like a refrigerator or a stove when you move it? Yeah, no. So th again, uh, the key thing there is that when you moved it, so when you moved it, I moved it on Saturday or I moved it uh, in April and this is what happened. That's a claim. Now, if it's, if it's the one, the, the one foot squares, you know, that might not be enough to, to, uh, to do a claim, but if that linoleum is a, um, I I've done it where it was a, a single sheet that fit throughout the entire floor, that whole floor then has to be replaced. That's a beautiful thing. I had it where the, the client had that happen and he had moved the refrigerator and had scarred that floor just in one little corner, a one inch corner. And I got the entire floor replaced for him. So that's how we do virtual inspections. That is why we are able to do the work we can do from our, our bedrooms, from our homes. Okay. It's because these cameras are very effective. As you could see with Roberts, when you saw that cement wall, you could see every imprint of the cement. When you saw that floor, you could see the decompression between the different planks. That's exactly what you're looking for. And it doesn't well, have to be anything more than that. If that is all you see, write it up. Let me come out or let a, a field adjuster come out, take a look at it and see if we can't get that client paid. Paul, if there are missing shingles and I mean, the, there's no visible evidence of like water getting in the house or anything like that. I mean, what are we looking at there? You're looking at uh, uh, maybe uh, anywhere between uh, $3,000 to $10,000 for a roofing a roof job. Because I know for a fact my next door neighbor is missing shingles. Well, then you should be calling him. You should be talking to him. You sh he's, he's, the insurance company owes him money. I'm starting to use that phrase a lot more, guys. Mm -hmm. I'm starting to use that phrase all the time. You know, I, I want to make sure they know the insurance company owes you money. Now, if, if, if your friend or your next door neighbor owed you money, how long would you go without letting them pay? How long are you going to let the insurance company for heaven's sakes, how long are you going to let them go without paying? Okay. They owe you money. Why don't you get your money so that you can make the repairs and you can maintain your home the way it's supposed to be maintained. And it's, it, it's a, it's a, it's a good argument. It's a really good argument. <laughs> hey, Hey, listen, uh, I got to get on. Carolyn and I are due on another call right now. Um, I want to thank you for being on this call. We're going to do this again at seven o'clock, uh, Pacific time, Jackson.